We can agree to differ. Yeah, can't stay. Get okay. in, man. Thanks, As the drama of Brexit plays out. The Prime Minister. Yeah. I've listened very carefully to what has been said in this chamber and out of it. One man's political career appears to have been recovering from the disgrace of accepting a free holiday in Sri Lanka. According to Ian Paisley, this was very much a working visit. For Ian Paisley, the scandal had threatened landmark consequences. People were saying, we're going to oust Paisley. He's out in his ear. This was their big chance. An historic petition that could have triggered a by-election, but fell short by just 444 votes. The vast majority of people in this constituency who meet me, who know me, who support me, have the opportunity to kick me out. 90.6% of them said, we're keeping you, big fella. We like you. By not declaring the holidays, Ian Paisley broke parliamentary rules. I made a mistake and I apologised for it and I was punished for it. Again safe in his North Antrim seat, he was jubilant. I actually think it was a miracle, to be perfectly blunt with you. He thought the sorry saga was well behind him. Is there anything else in the pipeline that you're worried about coming out that may do for Ian Paisley? No, certainly I'm not. Certainly I'm not, no. Nothing at all. I mean, that was a genuine mistake on my part. But tonight, Spotlight travels halfway around the world to reveal Sri Lanka may not have been a one-off. Evidence suggesting a shocking new breach appears to make nonsense of his previous assurances. We ask, is there another expensive foreign holiday Ian Paisley hasn't been telling the truth about? Sri Lanka. It's a long way for a North Antrim MP to travel for work. And Ian Paisley should know, he's come here a number of times on official parliamentary business. But in 2013, he took his family along, not once, but twice. Organised and funded by the Sri Lankan government, these trips had all the hallmarks of luxury holidays rather than official visits and a combined cost of many tens of thousands of pounds. Not that Ian Paisley is any stranger to foreign travel. As an MP, he's been on a string of legitimate, all-expenses-paid trips, at least 20 during the course of his parliamentary career. Aside from Sri Lanka, he's been everywhere, from Uganda and Taiwan, to the US and the Maldives on various sorts of missions. Some of these trips have been organised through his membership of what are known in Westminster as All Party Parliamentary Groups, or APPGs. There are hundreds of APPGs on an array of subjects, like jazz appreciation and artificial intelligence. But those linked to countries inevitably give rise to the opportunity for free foreign travel. At the time of his suspension, Ian Paisley was on nine country APPGs, including Sri Lanka, the Maldives and the Caribbean. That was almost as many as all his DUP colleagues put together. It's perfectly reasonable for MPs to accept free foreign travel, provided they follow this rule. Any visits that could be seen to influence their parliamentary activities that are of any significant value must be registered. But the problem for Ian Paisley is he broke the rules by not registering his Sri Lankan holidays. Sir Kevin Barron is the former chair of the Standards Committee. The reason we have these rules is that people shouldn't be taking uh, money from overseas and not declaring it. Ian Paisley explained his interest in Sri Lanka and his membership of the APPG were due to its parallels with Northern Ireland as a post-conflict country. 
Northern Ireland's had its problems as well. And they may argue the point that, you know, that's some experience that he'd had on the ground out there in Northern Ireland that he could pass on in, into another country. Ian Paisley, his wife and their children flew more than 6,000 miles to Sri Lanka in business class on two separate occasions. So we've come to the tropical island to follow in their footsteps. He and his family were treated like VIPs, with a chauffeur-driven Mercedes, helicopter rides, and accommodation in the best hotels in the country. Despite the lasting impression these trips must have made, Ian Paisley didn't register them as parliamentary rules required. These luxury holidays were paid for by the Sri Lankan government. A regime that had presided over a bloody civil war and had been condemned internationally for its human rights abuses. Following the trips, Ian Paisley wrote to the then Prime Minister David Cameron, urging him not to support a UN resolution on human rights abuses in Sri Lanka but he did not declare his interest in Sri Lanka in that letter, as he should have. The story broke in the national press in September last year. When we published the story, Mr Paisley uh, went on the attack uh, against the Telegraph. Uh, rather than uh, admitting that he'd been on the trip and that perhaps he should have registered it, he suggested that our story was completely untrue. He said it was devoid of logic. So rather than just coming clean about it, um, he blamed the messenger and made out that we had just got the whole thing wrong. Standards Commissioner Catherine Stone launched a formal inquiry just days later. And so began nearly a year of correspondence with Ian Paisley as she delved into the heart of the scandal. In the course of the commissioner's inquiry, the MP never appeared to express regret about accepting the holidays. A paid holiday is something that uh, I've never had from a foreign uh, government in 35 years uh, in Parliament. And quite frankly, if I'd have been offered one, it would have been no, thank you. Ian Paisley made repeated efforts to rebut the story. Among his biggest gripes was the duration of the holiday that took place in July. I think anyone who denies a story that's plainly true is, is already um, exacerbating the situation, but then he, he made matters even worse. Uh, by trying to um, obfuscate and muddy the waters uh, during the investigation uh, by uh, the parliamentary commissioner. Uh, for example, he produced bank statements, uh, which he claimed showed that he wasn't in Sri Lanka uh, at the time that we said he was. Ian Paisley used his London travel card to contest the dates. His bank statement showed a top-up of the Oyster card on the 5th of July four days after the Paisley's itinerary showed them travelling to Sri Lanka. But the commissioner was unconvinced. In fact, the investigation found that those bank statements showed dates when money was registered as having come out, rather than the day that the money had actually been paid out. The commissioner concluded that the statement showed the date the transaction was processed by the bank, not the date of the actual top-up. She said she therefore didn't regard it to be relevant evidence. Ian Paisley continued to dispute various elements of the holidays. Business class flights for the whole family for both trips were estimated at around £16,000. Ian Paisley told the commissioner the flights had been upgraded to business class at the last minute but the commissioner came back and pointed out the evidence. Email chains proving that the Sri Lankan government had approved the booking of business class flights in advance of their journey. It didn't appear to be a last minute upgrade, as the MP claimed. Then we have the helicopters. The government arranged for the family to be shuttled around the tropical island during both trips by air. 
According to the evidence, the helicopter bills for both trips combined came to around £18,000. It also revealed that the Sri Lankan Ministry of Defence even cleared airspace for the Paisleys. Such was the importance of these VIP guests. Mr Paisley argued that the cost of the helicopter rides was exaggerated, claiming he didn't take as many as the story suggested. He told the commissioner he couldn't recall four helicopter rides in the July trip. After she pushed him for a clear statement of how many helicopter trips you recall having taken during each visit, he replied that he could not recount with any degree of certainty the precise number of helicopter lifts made. The Sri Lankan government had planned a packed itinerary of visits to tourist hotspots like this one for that contested July trip. Are you ready? Nice and warm. But Ian Paisley insisted it wasn't all leisure, he was there on business. It was his parliamentary work, he said, that took the family to an elephant orphanage as guests of the Sri Lankan government. The government arranged for Ian Paisley, his wife Fiona and their two sons to come here during that July trip to Pinawala Elephant Orphanage. You can imagine it's the kind of place that tourists come to all the time in Sri Lanka. But according to Ian Paisley, this was very much a working visit. He said he had a detailed briefing with the manager and a behind the scenes visit with vets and staff. He told the commissioner this was an insight that wouldn't be available to tourists who are taken to lookout posts for photo opportunities. Ian Paisley also contested the cost of the holidays as originally reported. Ian Paisley argued there was no way the holidays totaled £100,000. So he offered to do his own calculations and he worked out that both trips combined cost half what the Telegraph claimed, just over £50,000. Ian Paisley said, no, they weren't, they were £50,000, but that's hardly a case for the defence. Those costs were way above any registrable level of receiving money, and it, they should have been declared in a right and proper way. He also hired a management consultant to do the sums. The consultant's brief was to err on the side of the more expensive. So while Ian Paisley disputed that the family was in Sri Lanka for 10 days in July, he said he would have his consultant base his calculations on a duration that length. When it came down to it, that's not what he and his consultant did. His calculations assumed a five-day stay in July, but the commissioner was quick to spot it and told him it didn't reflect the narrative that his figures would be based on a longer stay. I would be grateful, she said, if you would review and let me know how this should be corrected. Crucially, she added, I do not expect this to make any material difference to the outcome of my inquiry but this discrepancy should be resolved. 100,000 or 50,000 pounds, it didn't really matter. The trips were still well over the threshold at which MPs are required to register, which at the time was 660 pounds. While Mr. Paisley accepted he had failed to register both trips, he had an excuse for that too. A changeover in his staff meant the registration slipped through the cracks. But it was all to no avail. Ten months after the inquiry launched, Catherine Stone found Ian Paisley had breached parliamentary rules. He had failed to register the free holidays, and he was also found to have acted as a paid advocate for a foreign government by lobbying David Cameron to reject a UN resolution on human rights abuses in Sri Lanka. He was trying to persuade um, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, uh, that uh, Britain's position should be against uh, as he said, internationalising uh, the situation. Now, he said that um, because this happened about a year after he'd had those holidays, um, enough time had elapsed uh, for it not to be a conflict of interest. 
um, but the parliamentary investigation, um, of course, disagreed with that. You cannot have a situation where people are trying to influence our government. We believed it was paid advocacy. And what made matters worse, and this was an individual view that I held, that this was about potentially hiding away the abuse of human rights issues in the country. The commissioner submitted her findings to the Standards Committee. On his failure to declare the Sri Lankan trips, the report said, Mr. Paisley was conscious of the potential embarrassment that would be caused to him were it to become publicly known that he had accepted very expensive hospitality for himself and his family from a foreign government accused of serious human rights violations. Ian Paisley ultimately admitted his feelings in not registering the holidays. But on the issue of paid advocacy, he continued to fight right up to the publication of the committee's report. The very day before the report was published, he criticised the rules on declaration and paid advocacy, saying they totally contradict each other. He was adamant to the end that he was not a paid advocate for the Sri Lankan government, and a finding to the contrary, he said, would be unjust. But the Standards Committee, responsible for sanctioning MPs, supported the Commissioner's findings and clearly took a grave view of Mr Paisley's actions. We concluded that Mr Paisley had committed serious misconduct and that his actions, I quote, were of a nature to bring the House of Commons into disrepute. Order. Personal statement, Mr Ian Paisley. A week earlier, Ian Paisley had made a tearful apology in the Commons. It is with uh, profound personal regret and deep personal embarrassment that I have to make this statement. I failed to properly register and properly declare two overseas visits. I had no ul ulterior motive for that genuine mistake. I do recognise how serious a mistake it was. It is to my constituents, Mr Speaker, who have sent me here since 2010 that I make the profoundest of all apologies. I say sorry and apologise for the feelings. I have such remorse about the matter as I believe it goes against the grain of who I am, especially how it is portrayed. Ian Paisley was banned from the Commons for 30 sitting days and made history by becoming the first MP to face a recall petition which, with enough signatures, would trigger a by-election. He has always maintained that his failure to register those two family holidays to Sri Lanka was a genuine mistake. But what if there were a similar scenario involving another country? Could that be another genuine mistake? And if so, why hasn't he registered it? I was working for the Daily Telegraph's investigations team during the research stages of the Sri Lankan story. And during that digging, I came across this tweet by Ian Paisley's wife, Fiona. 5th of November, 2016. Everyone has a happy place at Maldives. Hashtag Coco Bodohithi. Hashtag the beach is my happy place. By the time the standards commissioner had concluded her inquiry a year later, I was a reporter here at Spotlight. It was the resurfacing of the story that made me think that I should revisit that tweet about the Maldives. But when I checked Fiona Paisley's Twitter timeline, the tweet was no longer there. Fortunately, I had taken a screenshot of the tweet back in 2017. It seemed significant at the time because Ian Paisley was a member of the Maldives APPG and had also made a number of statements about the country in Parliament. I give way to the honourable gentleman. The member for giving way and refer to my registered interests on Maldives. Curious about the tweet, I started looking into Ian Paisley's links with the Maldives. I came across some news reports about a trip he had taken in early 2016, in which he and some other MPs appeared to support the country's controversial and allegedly corrupt government. This was led by President Yamin, who had imprisoned a democratically elected predecessor, Mohammed Nasheed. They were taken to visit the prison where he had uh, detained political prisoners, including the former president, 
uh, Muhammad Nasheed and described the prison as a, actually rather quite luxurious. The fact it was a prison seemed to escape them. The trip, which was registered, was funded by the Maldivian High Commission in the UK and, according to reports, included business class flights and a stay at the exclusive Jen Hotel in the capital, Malé. Ian Paisley insisted he was under no one's influence. He said, if people are suggesting we are having our strings pulled by others, they don't know very much about me or my colleagues. By this point, the situation was so one-sided internationally in terms of the, the sort of recognition the Maldives had, had received by groups such as the UN Human Rights Commission, um, Amnesty International and many others that the sight of three British parliamentarians turning up um, to say thumbs up, everything's fine, um, was nothing short really of embarrassing. Nasheed had been released from prison shortly before their visit to travel to the UK for medical treatment. While here, he was granted asylum. His lawyer was Amal Clooney, who spoke out against the Maldivian government. You have an increasing authoritarian regime where uh, protesters are being rounded up and arrested, where um, lawyers are being attacked, and um, every opposition leader in the country is now either behind bars or um, being persecuted by the government. The lawyer urged tourists to boycott the Maldives and called for the US to impose sanctions. I do not understand why anyone who claims to love this place or claims to be a Maldivian at heart, why on earth they would want to have sanctions against their country. But Ian Paisley appeared to be acting as an advocate on behalf of the Yamin government. I think we need to make sure that message goes out loud and clear that sanctions would not pose any answer to any question or to any action in this country. Given the context of Mr Paisley's official visit to the Maldives in February 2016, I wanted to find out if there was more to Fiona Paisley's tweet later that year than I initially thought. We started to get in touch with people connected to the Maldives and eventually made contact with a well-placed source, Source A. This was a game changer. We've seen a series of WhatsApp messages from Source A giving specific details about the Paisley stay in the Maldives. And the information suggested we were onto something. Confirmation that the family holidayed at Coco Baruhithi Resort, as Fiona Paisley's tweet suggested, from the 30th of October to the 4th of November 2016. The messages contained details. They stayed in Villas 317 and 318, while they paid for extras themselves, $299, they were on full board with food and soft drinks in the main restaurant. The source also told us that the booking came through Mr Hilmi. That's Hussein Hilmi, one of the co-owners of the resort. But here's the really interesting bit. The source's messages indicated that the stay was complimentary. In other words, free of charge. We immediately checked the register of members' financial interests to see if Ian Paisley had registered a free holiday to the Maldives in October-November 2016. There was no record of this trip. So we decided to go and investigate. On our way, there's an important development. We learned that Ian Paisley has avoided a by-election by just 444 votes. Ian Paisley has thanked supporters after a petition to force a by-election in his constituency fell short of the required number. People are saying we're going to oust Paisley. He's out in his ear. This was their big chance. The vast majority of people in this constituency who meet me, who know me, who support me, have the opportunity to kick me out. 90.6% of them said we're keeping you, big fella. We like you. But it's a busy time in the Maldives too. We learn that our visit coincides with a fiercely contested general election. With the autocratic president Yamin fighting to retain power, foreign journalists are struggling to gain entry into the country. So we travel as tourists and check into the resort undercover.
This is Coco Bado Heathy, where the going rate for its most basic villas can easily exceed £1,000 per night. It's an internationally renowned luxury resort. And its guests included the Paisleys. We're told these island villas are the most basic on the resort. But whatever your budget, in a place like this, it's easy to be impressed. We check into our own villa, just a few doors up. Welcome to my island villa. Let me show you around. The first thing that struck me when I came in was this bath. Check it out. And you can see here at the foot of the bed, we've got this incredible view of our very own plunge pool. It's not bad. Look at this. A bit of a spa touch and then a bit of local flavour with this wee bag, which is just perfect for the beach. Come on, let's go. It doesn't get more luxurious than your very own private beach. Followed by some much needed refreshments. Then there's dinner at the buffet. We know that the Paisleys had their meals in this restaurant. Full board was included in their stay. Champagne for breakfast. This is what you get when you travel five star in the Maldives. Cheers. We've been waited on hand and foot. Everything has been thought of. Like in the mornings, a man comes and rakes the sand outside the villa to get rid of the footprints from the night before. They have not missed even the tiniest detail. But the thing that strikes me most, I think, is the seclusion. You could go for hours here without seeing another soul. It really does feel like you're on your own private island. It's not your average holiday. Back in Northern Ireland, the man himself is in his own paradise. I actually think it was a miracle, to be perfectly blunt with you. Buoyed by victory after the recall petition failed to garner enough votes to trigger a by-election. I made a mistake and I apologised for it and I was punished for it. In his correspondence with the Standards Commissioner, he had said, I have dutifully registered all other visits before and after and clearly made a mistake on this occasion in March and July in 2013. Is there anything else in the pipeline that you're worried about coming out that may do for Ian Pearson? No, I certainly am not. Certainly I'm not, no. There's nothing? Nothing at all. But is that really the case? Working discreetly at Coco, we set about verifying the evidence we've gathered so far. Sources' WhatsApp messages revealed the Paisleys stayed in villas 317 and 318. Could we match the photo in Fiona Paisley's tweet to the location of either of those? We got up quite early this morning to go to find the place where Fiona Paisley took that picture that she tweeted. I think it's just down here. And then we strike gold. This is Villa 317. We have to be really quiet because I think there are people staying here at the minute. But yeah, I think this could be the place. I think it all looks the same. I, I think this is where she stood and she took that photo of her happy place. I mean, look around. This is a pretty happy place to be. What's wrong then with a hard-working MP taking his family on holiday over the Halloween break? Absolutely nothing, if he paid for it himself. We know the Paisleys stayed here, but what about the payment? According to Source A's claims, the stay was complimentary. 
Sorsay's messages suggested, both villas and all transfers were complimentary when they came here. Their food was covered and their soft drinks were paid for. So how much then did this cost Ian Paisley? Again, we know that he spent $299 over the course of five days. So who then picked up the rest of the bill? That's the question. Back home, Ian Paisley is out of the woods. And I'm going to give way to uh, my honourable friend over there. Thank the uh, Secretary of State for giving way. With Sri Lanka behind him, his suspension draws to an end and he returns to Parliament. But what he doesn't know is Spotlight's investigation is just getting started. We've acquired documentation from another source, Source B, that appears to bolster our evidence. It confirms the family holiday to Coco, it confirms the dates, it confirms the room numbers, the full board, but it seems to take us a step further and it tells us it was either paid for in cash or booked locally. And in giving us this information, Source B stresses that the Paisleys paid for drinks and extras on a cash basis themselves. So does that, as it suggests, mean that they didn't pay for their own accommodation? And in which case, who did? To answer that, we have to go back to the Maldives. This is a moment of hope. This is a moment of history. Since our last visit, the contentious general election took a surprise turn with the democratic opposition topping the polls. A change in government brings new hope for the people of the Maldives and a warmer welcome for foreign journalists. So we travel to the country's capital to push on with our investigation. We have evidence that Ian Paisley, his wife Fiona and their two sons holidayed in the Maldives. And we believe that that holiday was complimentary. Now, as an MP, Ian Paisley should have declared that trip. But as we know from the Register of Members' Financial Interests, he didn't. Our first stop is a visit to Sunland the umbrella organisation that owns a company called Coco Collection and its resort Coco Bodu Heathy. I asked to speak to the resort director, Hussein Hilmi, first mentioned to us by Source A, but he isn't here. We have been told that it wouldn't have been uncommon for the government to have funded trips by other British politicians in the past. We may have had no luck with the resort owner, Mr Hilmi, but the tide turns and we make contact with a new source, Source C. This is someone with close links to the resort and the wider business around it. Due to the confidential nature of our meeting in Malay, we're using an actor Hello. to recreate it. Come on, on in. Come on, on in. Just right through here. I've spoken to two individuals in the organisation who separately gave me information. Both contacts confirmed that the place they stay was free of charge. That's my part, part of the aim. Source C goes even further. They both told me that they have seen records showing that the holiday was arranged by Mr. Hilmi at the request of the government. But is there any evidence to support this? I have seen a document, and part of the detail describes arrangements for meeting the family at the airport, with a representative holding up a name board with the Paisley name on it. I asked Sourcey if there was anything he could give me by way of evidence, so he arranged for me to be sent photographic proof on WhatsApp. An image of the resort's internal records that appeared to confirm everything we needed to know. It indicated that the stay was complimentary and booked through Mr Hilmi, and crucially, it suggested it was done so at the request of the Maldivian government. So what does this suggest? It suggests that Ian Paisley may have accepted yet another free luxury family holiday from yet another government with a questionable human rights record. A government for whom he had advocated. We estimate the accommodation alone would have cost, at market rate, easily several thousands of pounds. 
well in excess of the current £300 threshold for registration. I'm just catching up with some news from back home and I see that Ian Paisley has given an interview to his local newspaper to coincide with his return to Parliament following his suspension. And he says, a smaller man would have crumbled under the criticism he received. Certainly seems to be putting the whole experience behind him. But what about this new Maldives holiday? We wrote to Ian Paisley last Monday. At the time of our email, he had been attending a Brexit debate in the House of Commons. As a result of Northern Ireland ending up in this backstop, which would be utterly shameful, Northern Ireland will become an annex of the United Kingdom. We asked him a number of questions. Did he and his family go on the holiday? Did he pay for it? Did he accept that it was booked by Mr Hilmy and at the request of the government? And why did he not register it? On Thursday evening, Mr Paisley rang to answer my questions. He confirmed that they had indeed stayed at Kokobadu Heathi and described this as a family holiday. Did he accept that he did not pay for it? Ian Paisley's reply was, no, not entirely. Mr Paisley said he paid for part of the trip and a long-term friend who was unconnected to his work paid for the other part. He insisted the friend had received no benefit from him or his work. When it came to the key question, did the MP accept that his holiday had been booked by the resort's owner, Mr Hilmy, at the request of the Maldivian government, his answer was no. He said he had evidence that categorically disproves that the trip was connected to the government. Emails which he had arranged from contacts linked to the regime and the resort. The first was from Ahmed Shian, who was the Maldivian ambassador to the UK at the time of the visit. He said the holiday had not been arranged by the embassy or paid for by the government of the Maldives. Ian Paisley also sent us an email from the resort's commercial operating officer, Andrew Ashmore, who said invoices for the stay had been settled and paid for privately. But perhaps more important was Ian Paisley's response to our final question. Why did he not register the holiday? He said he had talked to the parliamentary commissioner about this very trip. He said they'd discussed the circumstances and who paid and the reason for the visit and the fact that it was a family holiday and that the visit was not, as he described it, declarable. We immediately wrote to the Standards Commissioner to ask if she had indeed advised Mr Paisley on this holiday and on what grounds. Catherine Stone's office told us she could not comment on confidential conversations. But just a few hours later, I received a text from Ian Paisley with a clarification. He hadn't spoken to the Commissioner at all but rather the Registrar of Members' Financial Interests, who works within the Commissioner's office. We wrote to the Registrar too. Like the Commissioner, she would not comment on confidential conversations. However, it seems reasonable to suppose that Ian Paisley would have told the Registrar the same thing he told us, that the holiday was paid for in part by himself, and in part by a long-term friend who didn't stand to benefit. Gavin Miller QC is an expert on public and parliamentary law and the Nolan principles, which govern the conduct of public life. We asked him if under the circumstances as outlined by Mr Paisley, the MP should have registered the holiday. 
the circumstances in which he received the benefit following on only a few months after his uh, parliamentary visit to the Maldives and his advocacy of the government's position in relation to various aspects of the uh, issues that arose on the trip um, gives rise to one would have thought for a reasonable person uh, a belief that uh, there is a connection between the two, that there, is a there was a connection between the payment for the holiday and the parliamentary trip and the advocacy. And if that reasonable perception of a link exists, the MP should err on the side of caution and register the benefit. Is there any onus on him to reveal the identity of the friend? There is an onus on him under the rules uh, and the Nolan principles to be open and to be transparent. Uh, there's a very important onus on him. It's one of the most important principles in the Parliamentary Code of Guidance. And I'm going to tell you what it says. MPs should give reasons for their decisions and restrict information only when the wider public interest clearly demands. My judgment in this instance, given the issues that have been raised, uh, is that unless he can come up with some wider public interest argument for not saying more, he should be saying significantly more about the source of the holiday uh, and any considerations that are relevant to the motive of that source in paying that money. I also asked Gavin Miller if he felt it was reasonable for Mr Paisley to rely on his undisclosed conversation with the registrar. It doesn't do any harm to speak to the registrar or the registrar's office. They know every detail of the rules, it's their job to know them. And therefore the one thing they can give you as an MP is a clear account of what the rules require and they don't require. But I understand that is as far as they will go. They will not give, uh, as it were, a license to an MP not to declare in a particular situation, nor will they say you must declare in a particular situation. That's not how the code works. Where the code works is it is ultimately always a matter for the MP. But what if, as our sources suggest, the holiday was arranged through Mr. Hilmy, one of the owners of the resort where the family stayed and a leading tourism magnet. As we know, one of Sorce's WhatsApp messages said the holiday was booked through Mr. Hilmy. It also said it was charged to his account. So who is Mr. Hilmy? We've discovered he's more than just a resort owner. Hussein Hilmi was a cabinet minister under the regime of a previous dictator, Mamoun Abdul Gayoum. Mamoun Abdul Gayoum was responsible in part for sort of bringing up the tourism trade. You could say that in many cases there's no difference between a Maldivian politician, a Maldivian uh, businessman. They do tend to overlap. Many MPs have tourism interests. Many politicians have stakes or shares in resorts. At the time of the Paisley's holiday, the president of the Maldives was the controversial Yamin, who was Gayoum's half-brother. Interestingly, Source A had speculated in his WhatsApp messages that Mr. Hilmi had arranged the holiday on behalf of Yamin. Gavin Miller says accepting a holiday from an overseas source such as Mr. Hilmi would put a greater onus on the MP to register it. One question will lead to another for an MP in this situation. So if Mr. Hilmi was the source, He's an overseas source who we know objectively, beyond any dispute, has connections with the current Maldives government. And at that point, if that's in the public domain and that is known about and admitted, 
seems to me that a very heavy onus arises on an MP in Mr Pace's circumstance to be able to say, I took these steps, X, Y and Z, before accepting the holiday, to absolutely render certain in my own mind that this was nothing to do with my work as an MP. But of course, the fundamental question of our investigation is not about what Mr Paisley should have done if the holiday was paid for by a friend, or indeed by Mr Hilmy, but rather, was it a free holiday, arranged at the request of the Maldivian government, as our sources suggest? And let's remember, this was a regime on whose behalf Ian Paisley had lobbied just earlier that year. As we know, Ian Paisley is adamant that he did not accept a holiday from the Maldivian government. But there remains the evidence of Spotlight's source, C. He told us he'd spoken to two people within the resort and that they both separately told him they'd seen a record that the booking was at the request of the Maldivian government and free of charge. And crucially, that is what the document which has been supplied to us from within the resort appears to confirm. We've been given a document that's come from someone within the organisation. So I'm, I'm just going to, to show it to you here. Um, if this is true, should Mr Paisley have registered this trip? I don't think he should have accepted the trip. Really? But having accepted it, uh, he certainly should have uh, registered it, undoubtedly. Because there are very strict rules about lobbying and creating an interest for yourself that may be perceived as lobbying. The moment you know these facts that are disclosed in this document, the perception is that this is a reward for him having advocated for the Maldives government. If the document is accurate, this therefore raises serious questions for Mr Paisley. But what of those emails he supplied? We wrote to the former ambassador, Mr Sheehan, and asked him to confirm the trip had not been booked at the request of the government. But could it have happened without his knowledge? In response, Mr Sheehan didn't answer that question. I also spoke to the resort's Mr Ashmore, who denied that the stay was complimentary. He said it was paid for privately, but admitted he had no idea by whom, despite having checked the records, as he said they didn't show that. During the course of our conversation, Mr Ashmore revealed that he had discussed the matter with Mr Hilmy, the man whom he referred to as his director. Mr Hilmy had previously told us that it was inaccurate to say that he had arranged the booking and that it might have originated from any source, sponsored by anyone. Following my conversation with Mr Ashmore, I tried to get in touch with Mr Hilmy again. It turned out that the day before Mr Ashmore and I spoke, Mr Hilmy had been arrested. According to local reports, he had bounced a check. Mr. Hilmy was in jail. Ian Paisley, uh, uh, Ian Paisley has also been busy over the last week. On the day he addressed our questions on the telephone, he had been answering questions about the looming parliamentary vote on Brexit. Well, I suppose nothing focuses the mind like a hanging. And next week, the Prime Minister will be staring into the abyss. In a further statement tonight, Mr Paisley reiterated his position, saying, I have responded in clear and categoric terms to your questions. You have clearly been attempting to encourage responses that would fit in with your agenda against me. For the record, he said, the government of the Maldives did not organise or pay for my family vacation in 2016, which I do not intend to go into with you. I'm satisfied the vacation did not have to be recorded on the register. Nevertheless, the North Antrim MP may be one of the very few members of Parliament who has to focus on something other than Brexit this week.